Welcome to Eye on America. I'm Michelle Miller. Today we cover the complexities of our current political landscape. In Texas, we see how a younger workforce is leading the charge on unionization efforts. And in New Jersey, we visit the birthplace of the only president to win two non-consecutive terms. But we begin with a look at the darker side of serving in public office. Over the past two years, harassment of local elected officials, Democrats and Republicans alike, is up 55 percent. Caitlin Huey Burns speaks with small town politicians and officials worried about the growing toxicity in all levels of office. These days, for local politicians in Washoe County, Nevada, there's less and less that's civil about their discourse, especially when it comes to their school board. I want you to take these books Order. out of the school. It's pornography. So when Beth Smith joined the school board, she knew she'd be challenged. But she didn't expect to read blogs like this, detailing her painful divorce and making light of her recent battle with cancer. When I see messaging with death imagery, I know that it's part of their attacks to get me to stop doing this work. Well, sound like uh, little sissies. Local political activist Robert Beatles might be the brawler with the barest knuckles in Washoe County. I have a ton of money and I'm going to do everything that I can to remove sure. all of sure. you. Beatles, seen here three years ago, says he made millions in crypto and real estate. He wrote the blog post about Smith. Are you a bully? If they're running for office and they can't take the truth about them being told in whatever light, then maybe they shouldn't be running for office. Smith isn't alone facing menacing tactics here. In 2022, both a Washoe County Commission candidate and Reno's mayor found GPS trackers on their cars. The police questioned the private investigator. He wouldn't name his client, but he did talk motive. Is it political or, or personal? It's political. Okay. 100%. It's all part of a new brand of politics experts are calling lawful but awful. And it's on the rise for local officials, city managers. These are the people that are screwing us over as citizens. And county clerks. An unknown individual threw a partial pipe bomb into my house. While my are bearing the brunt. The Texas mayor received a threatening package containing a noose and a note that read, get out of the race now. Harassment of local officials, Democrats and Republicans alike, is up 55 percent over the past two years, according to a Princeton study. Shannon Hiller ran the study. The sort of persistent and rising threats and harassment could be effective and really disrupting democratic processes at their most local level. In Washoe County, politics can sometimes feel like the Wild West. I don't like D.C. that much. They won't let me carry Daphne there. Who's Daphne? <laughs> My 45. Where lawful but awful seems to be working, says County Republican Chair Bruce Parks. If you want to bring light to something, do you just whisper the information to somebody? Or do you want to get their attention? Even as politics in Washoe look more and more like Washington. I beat cancer and I definitely will not stop because of this. Beth Smith's decision to stick it out just landed her a spot on the county school board for another term. We continue examining the sometimes contentious atmosphere in U.S. politics. One nonprofit is helping strangers bridge the red versus blue divide. StoryCorps facilitates in-person conversations between people from different social and political backgrounds, seeking to find common ground and understanding. Jim Axelrod sat in on one session. Gary right here. Here's something you don't see every day. My name is Gary Sneed. I'm 66 years old. Two men from different generations. My name is Patrick Kleber. I'm 29 years old. And opposite ends of the political spectrum. I grew up in a conservative Catholic family. Died in the wool liberal. Sitting down for a nice, civil chat. You may not agree with everything that I say. It's OK. That's what's most important. StoryCorps' Claire LeBlanc oversees this conversation. It involves taking a brave step, like one small step. The idea? In an online world where anger can fester anonymously, face-to-face -face contact might be the only hope. 
there are levels of contact, particularly repeated contact, that can slowly start to change people's relationships to each other. It's hard to hate someone you're actually in contact with. Yeah, and that's what I hear a lot of participants find in their conversation. Gary and Patrick um, aren't here to debate. It's not about changing somebody's mind, getting your point across. They're here to learn that Just assumption prevents us from seeing each other. The died in the world liberal? I'm a staunch advocate of the Second Amendment. The rock-ribbed conservative? Honestly, I've come around on things like universal health care. You want to eat some? And that we are all more than our politics. Oh, the best time. These two men share the deep pain of significant loss. I know you and your wife lost a child to a miscarriage. I lost a child at 15 years of age. We both belong to the club that no one should ever have to belong to. Yeah. We'd only known she was pregnant for maybe two weeks and then went in for the first ultrasound and no heartbeat. And that was, that was brutal. We agree on many things. Anyone can sign up to be part of a one small step conversation online if they're open to an idea. My spirituality tells me that what you call God, I call the universe. That disagreements don't have to be deal breakers. I definitely fundamentally disagree. That's fine. One of the few things we do agree on these days in the divided states of America is just how divided we are. We did a poll asking people to give the State of the Union in a word. 61% chose divided, five times the number that chose united. Sitting across from somebody, tighten your lips. You know? And opens your ears? I hope so. 50 minutes later, these are. two have um, taken one small step. I want to thank you for opening up about your son, and uh, I'm grateful that we had the opportunity to talk about that. As am I, my friend. No surprise to Claire LeBlonde, who's conducted 198 of these. We're so divided, so filled with contempt, and yet the one thing we're not doing is sitting with each other. Yeah, that's not the world I live in, where everybody is so divided. It, I live in one small step world. It may not be enough to solve the problem, but even one small step in the right direction is much better than none at all. Capital, which is the best. Coming up, how recreational sports is becoming the latest battleground in the fight for transgender rights. This is I on America. Welcome back. This past summer, officials in New York's Nassau County signed a law banning trans female athletes from playing recreational team sports at county-owned facilities. Jerika Duncan introduces us to a roller derby team who say they've been drawn into an unexpected battle for justice. The Long Island Roller Rebels, a flat track roller derby team, are taught to skate fast, get low, and hit hard. But in recent months, they've taken a hit they weren't expecting because some of the members on this team are transgender women. Trans women are women. We should just continue to categorize them as women. 33-year-old Amanda Urena is the president of the Long Island-based rec group. In February, the team's future took a major turn when Nassau County Executive Bruce Blakeman signed an order denying permits to women's or girls' sporting events with transgender participants. And this is not about the use of bathrooms. This is about the use of the county's more than 100 public facilities, like basketball courts, parks, even pools, that would be off limits to transgender women playing a sport on a team advertised as one for women and girls. What prompted you to take this action? We started hearing from a lot of girls and a lot of women that they thought it was very unfair and very unsafe. If the people within that organization don't see a problem with it, why do you? I don't. Just don't say you're all girl and all female and then have biological males competing. Back in March, the American Civil Liberties Union of New York filed a lawsuit challenging the ban. Last month, the judge ruled the county executive, quote, acted beyond the scope of his authority. Gabriela Larios is an attorney for the ACLU of New York. 
In 2019, New York amended its human rights law and its civil rights law to explicitly prohibit discrimination against transgender people. We are confident that under our state anti-discrimination laws, whatever version of this passes will be struck down. Nearly 150 anti-LGBTQ bills are under consideration in the United States. Of those, 21 target transgender athletes. Since Blakeman's executive order, four other states have come closer to passing bills targeting that group. I think it's about protecting people's rights to be able to participate in the activities that have been paid for by their communities through taxes. We fully believe we are standing in the right place in history and that we are standing up for Nassau County, we're standing up for people's rights. For people who say, as a transgender woman, my rights are not being protected. What do you say to them? What about the rights of women? Compete in a co-ed league, form a transgender league. We're not anti-transgender. We are pro-women. For now, the rebels are beating the opposition by renting practice space in private facilities, but they haven't given up on what they see as a fight for justice. For them, where there's a will, there's a way to keep rolling. We turn now to a growing push for unionization in the workforce. Support for organized labor is at its highest level since the mid-1960s. Gen Z workers, many just starting their careers, are at the forefront of this shift. Janet Shamlian looks into the rising efforts to unionize. Uh, you want to get a better benefit than a pension plan? Juan and Diego Quintanilla are sheet metal workers campaigning near their job site in Richmond, Texas. We're offering better pay, better benefits. Not for a candidate, for an organization. They want to unionize. If you belong to the union, they're going to take money out of your paycheck. Yeah, but the benefits that we're going to get, it makes up for way more than what they're going to take. The 19 and 23 year old brothers are lobbying these tradespeople to vote yes. What is it about your generation that's more interested in unions? We seem to really care about fairness and like equality in the workplace. We all kind of want to get paid a good amount of money for the work that we're putting in. Support for organized labor polls indicate is at a high not seen since the 1960s. Strongest among Generation Z, people in their teens and 20s. Unions have been out of favor for decades. 20% of workers belong to one in 1983. But by 2020, that number had fallen by half. Even as membership drops, union support is rising. 71% of Americans approve of them. Unions had a difficult time making inroads in the South. University of Texas associate professor Adam Cobb has studied unions. Why do you think a lot of young people are so supportive of unions right now? We see a really heavy concentration of power among big corporations and the elites that run them. And unions are a counterbalance to the strength of corporate power on the one hand and sort of shift some of that power to workers. This is our shop. Sheet metal worker Amber Sage Oliver is part of that young and new to the workplace group. Oliver estimates the same work in a non-union shop would pay at least $200 a week less. Currently I'm making about $33 an hour. So that's pretty good in comparison to people who just got out of college or university. I don't buy the overall trend. Erin Davis Valdez is a former teacher and union member. She says the teachers union let her down, motivating her to get into public policy to oppose them. If you look at rates of unionization over time, they've either remained flat or gone way down. So I don't view this as an overall long term trend. So do you think this is misguided loyalty on the part of Gen Z's? I think what will happen is they will be disappointed by uh, what unions promise versus what they deliver. That argument is just noise for the Quintanilla brothers. So you guys are sold on unions. You're all in. 100%. We're all in. Ahead, how one former president's unusual achievement could be repeated this year. That story is next. We close our show honoring a unique figure in American history. Grover Cleveland served as the 22nd and 24th president. So far, he's the only person to serve two non-consecutive terms. But that could change with this year's election. Scott McFarland visits President Cleveland's New Jersey hometown, where his legacy is always on display. You're looking at one of America's most humble historic sites. 
the birthplace of one of just 14 men to ever serve eight years as U.S. president. And yes, it's across the street from a gas station and a donut shop. This house in Caldwell, New Jersey, about 20 miles outside of New York, is where Grover Cleveland was born, near the Presbyterian Church where his dad was pastor. Sharon Farrell has been the tour guide here since 1980. This was the family parlor. This is where all of the activity took place. Cleveland was America's 22nd president, and its 24th president, too. The only president to ever win a rematch after losing the White House. Nationwide, there is little to mark this unique presidency, other than a rest area off the New Jersey Turnpike. Caldwell also has the Grover Cleveland Apartments and Grover Cleveland Park, Middle School, and even this parking spot. But Cleveland is beloved here in Caldwell, including by Carlos Pomares, who says 130 years later, Cleveland was his inspiration to run for the local county commission. How could you not be inspired? The guy had this meteoric rise in a matter of four years based on just being a hard worker, honest, brutally honest at times, yeah. and uh, being one who just uh, stuck to his, to his beliefs. You think he was principled? Absolutely. Let's see what you got. Let's pull the first one out. Pomares' home is filled with Cleveland historic pieces. Ribbons, busts, and that is a Grover Cleveland brandy bottle. It's got the cork in it still. But outside of Caldwell, this unparalleled president is relatively unknown. Grover Cleveland is one of the strangest stories in terms of somebody getting to the White House. I always think the most interesting place to start with Cleveland is in the middle of his life. Troy Senek is author of A Man of Iron, A Life Story of Cleveland. If you go to the year 1881, that's the year he turns 44, and you found Grover Cleveland, you would find a boring, balding, unmarried, work-a-day lawyer in Buffalo living in a little apartment above his law practice. The only reason that any of this is interesting is I'm describing to you somebody who's three years away from becoming the president of the United States. Cleveland, the fifth of nine children in a middle-class family, parlayed a law career in New York into becoming mayor of Buffalo and briefly governor of New York. Viewed as principled and ethical, Cleveland was drafted by Democratic Party bosses to run for president amid an era of corruption, patronage, and unethical power brokers. He won, making history, but not headlines. If you're looking at the late 19th century, if you're looking at the Gilded Age, the debates are about tariffs. They're about silver in the money supply. They're about pensions for union veterans. We don't know how to think about any of these things. That's not exciting stuff. It's not exciting stuff. He began as a rare bachelor president. His White House wedding to a friend's daughter, 27 years younger than him, was a spectacle. They were married in the blue room of the White House. John Philip Sousa led the band. And, Big uh, event. Yeah, it was uh, ships, uh, bells went off, whistles went off, church bells were chiming. Cleveland lost his reelection race to Indiana Republican Benjamin Harrison in 1888, despite winning the popular vote. And he was initially content with retirement. He was somewhat relieved. He felt that he had done a decent job in his first term. Until he was pressed by his party leaders to run again in 1892 and narrowly vanquished his old rival, Harrison and move back into 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. As Donald Trump seeks to equal Cleveland's accomplishment, Senek warns other than both being New Yorkers and disliking the press, the two men couldn't be more different. But they really occupy very different places in their parties because you have Cleveland fighting this rear guard to keep the Democratic Party from changing. And Trump is on the opposite side of this equation. He is leading the populist insurgency in the Republican Party. So. Trump's a revolutionary. Cleveland is a counter-revolutionary. Though Cleveland's new first lady foreshadowed the comeback in the final days of her husband's first term. She tells a member of the domestic staff in the White House, make sure that you pack up everything very carefully because we want it to be just where we remember it when we come back. And the staffer assumes that they're planning some visit in the Harrison administration. Says, Mrs. Cleveland, when will that be? She said, we're coming back four years from today. Cleveland's second victory came just weeks before the start of an economic panic and crisis. It crippled the nation and consumed Cleveland's second term. It was the worst thing the country had seen up to that time. In his and first year? In his first year back. So he has this window of good luck that is just small enough to get him back to the presidency. And it does not stay with him during his second term. 
Pomares says Cleveland may not have made a dent in the history books, but he made Washington a more honest place. Why does nobody else talk about him? Because he wasn't flashy. <laughs> he wasn't, he wasn't a about me kind of guy. For more stories like these and live coverage of breaking news, stream us right here on CBS News 24-7. I'm Michelle Miller. Thank you for watching Eye on America.